actually, rather than spending 10 hours a week on doing my bookkeeping, I should get a bookkeeper in who I can pay for half the price. Business of Architecture UK, episode 26. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. On Thursday, the 11th of October, 2018, the Business of Architecture UK will be having our next live event at UNI offices in Howick Place in Victoria, London. We're going to be having a panel discussion with leading architects and entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders, and we will be discussing making money, profit, cash flow, and making impactful architecture. Tickets have now gone on sale, and the early bird tickets have now finished, but you can still grab tickets. The link is in the information below, so just click on that, and it'll take you to an Eventbrite page, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. My name's Ryan Willard, and I'm your host, and today comes from... Tower Bridge, where I am in conversation with Simon Berry, who is the CEO of Fresh Projects, who, which is a, a company that specializes in making architectural practice management software. And it's a really fascinating story because Simon himself comes from an engineering background. He's got an MBA in business from Cambridge. And he's kind of merged these two worlds with a mission to serve the architectural and engineering industries to help those industries run their businesses better and helping us raise our fees and run profitable businesses. So there's a lot of insight here. Um, Simon goes into um, fee calculations and many of the areas that architects miss and are not aware of in terms of the metrics and the numbers with their companies. And it's fascinating listening. So enjoy. And if you want to hear more from Simon, come along to our BOA UK event in October as he'll be speaking there and running a cash flow exercise. And their company is actually one of our sponsors for the event. So definitely worth a listen. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I'm here with Simon Berry, who is the CEO of Fresh Projects. So welcome to the show, Simon. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure to have you. Um, so you're, you're the CEO of a company, Fresh Projects, and you specialize in software for practice management for architects. You're also collaborating with us on the next live BOA event, which is happening in October, where you're going to be running our audience through a cash flow exercise to help them understand better the financials of their business. So how did you come to set up Fresh Projects, and what are the problems that you often encounter architects facing in their businesses? So I think to, to answer that in a long way is to quickly talk about myself and my journey to how I got there. So I'm an engineer by training um, and I've been working as a building services engineer for about 10 years um, in the UK um, and I kind of looked around and I saw all my friends who were working in the city in financial services or in management consultants and they were earning five, ten times what I was earning as, a, as an engineer in the, in the built environment. And this was incredibly frustrating for me mm. and, and irritating. And I, I kind of decided I had had enough of this built environment and I was going to go off and become a, a banker myself. So I left and studied an MBA. Um, and during the year that I was studying the MBA at, at Cambridge, I um, uh, came to two conclusions. Firstly, um, through meeting a, a bunch of people who had come from the financial services industry and, and from management consulting, realized that actually the grass wasn't that green on the other side. Um, and secondly, and probably more importantly, is that uh, if you are lucky enough to have something that you're passionate enough, uh, about as a, as a, in your profession and that you really care about, which typically most engineers and architects do, they, mm. they, they are in the career because they're passionate about designing and, and solving problems, um, that that is worth a lot more than what money can, can buy. So, mm. um, that was kind of an epiphany for me and decided then as a result to stay in the built environment. 
but uh, after that decided to change the focus slightly so rather than being a, a full out uh, building services engineer was to try and empower the industry as a whole and that was where Fresh Projects was born a little bit later um, but the mission now is to try and make sure that uh, as an industry we are more aware financially of what we're doing yeah. um, and become more profitable and through that we can hopefully uh, attract and retain the best talent and make the whole environment as a whole uh, one which is very attractive to everyone and, and we keep the, the really good guys in it and, and we become aspirational for everyone. Mm. And, so, and so what are the kind of main obstacles that you see or encounter with architects? in so, their businesses yeah so I mean one of the and it's, a, it's a, almost a scientific fact that one of the things about architects and engineers is that our personality types is such that we actually aren't very good at um, very analytical and sort of data based processing so if you look at for example the Myers-Briggs personality test where it actually um, classifies your personality according to a bunch of questions that you answer you'll find typically that the sort of general managers and accountants um, are of a certain personality type mm. um, and they're good at handling lots of detail oriented data and, and doing administration. Um, and if you look at architects and engineers, we are very good at concepts and solving problems and thinking uh, ab in abstract terms. Right. But we don't actually like admin. And I, I don't think I've yet to meet an architect who said to me they love doing admin and love running the business side and worrying about all the paperwork and stuff like that. Yeah. So we tend to just ignore it um, and focus on solving the problem or creating, the, designing a building or doing something like that. Um, to our detriment. Mm. And do you think a lot of architects and engineers don't make that connection between the healthy business practices and actually that being a facilitator of good design and creativity? Yeah, I think we, we, we tend to ignore it and just hope, hope for the best. Um, but I mean, one of the, the sort of key messages that we give when we go out and talk to people is that unless you get the financials right, and you make sure that you're making money, you're not going to be able to do the design and the, the cool stuff. So if you, get, if you get the fundamentals right, get your, your cash flow right, get your fees right, um, that will empower you to actually do the stuff you love doing, which is the uh, creating and designing. And yeah. But if you don't, then you're going to go out of business and you can uh, go work at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and so what does Fresh Projects do? So what we've, we recognize straight away and based on exactly what we were saying is that architects, engineers don't like doing the admin. So it's important to not try and force uh, people to do things they don't like. Um, yet at the same time, it's, as we said, it's, it's, it's critical that we do do something. So Fresh Projects is aimed at really answering three questions, um, which is what projects are making money, uh, which clients should I work for, and which of my staff is being the most effective or least effective. Um, and we don't try and worry about too many metrics and too much detail. Uh, the focus is very much on, on being able to get something in place. So it may only be 80% right, but at least it's something. Right. And be able to do that quickly and get it out the way and, and move on to the other stuff. Um, uh, but at least you're doing something in order to manage your business and manage your practice. And w which... So the, the software does this automatically? It's, uh, how does it? Yeah, so we, I mean, if you look at, uh, at a project level, uh, one of the first things we, we allow you to do is work out what is a job going to cost you. Right. Um, and that's the starting point before working out what fee you should be charging, although that's not always the case. Sometimes you get told what fee you're going to be earning, and then, you, then the colliery is that you want to be able to work out how much can you afford to spend on the, on the job. But either way, so the software will allow you to very quickly, and I'm talking... 30 seconds here is work out what is a job going to cost you at a high level. So you'd say it's going to this project's going to last 12 months or 18 months, and I'm going to be this involved with it, and these people are going to be that much involved, and you can get a, a, a very good idea of what it's going to cost you. So that's the first aspect is working out your fee and and also being able to send a proposal to your client. And then the second key element is whatever the fee is that you've agreed with your client uh, is to be able to make sure that your spend on that project stays within that. Um, so that's about tracking your costs on a job um, and that's the bulk of that is time. So we sell time as a profession. Mm. So being able to allocate uh, what time you've been spending on jobs uh, and costing that time 
and then as well as any other expenses you might have and, and making sure that you're tracking your costs over the project life cycle and again the focus is on keeping that simple so that you can do that in a couple of seconds uh, and being able to know where you sit on the project and then finally we have uh, a billing interface where you can actually issue invoices to your clients right. and track whether they paid you or not um, and then we have dashboards that are pretty architects like pretty yeah um, uh, that in a picture can tell you the health of your project rather than reading reams and reams of spreadsheets. You can just look at one pretty picture and understand what's going on. So that that's one of the things, you know, when we, when, like from my own experience, when I first get a project, being able to accurately assess how much it's actually going to cost me to do it and to use that as a gauge to, um, you know, price a job. And, you know, in the, in the old days, there's, fee tables that Reba might have produced or yeah. there's other sort of standard fee calculators that you can kind of that you can also use um is it is it kind of that, that similar sort of mechanism yes so uh, i mean you're right in saying a lot of the industry even though fee guidelines in the uk were banned 20 odd years ago i think mm. it was um, a lot of architects still have rules of thumbs or they've got a copy of the old fee guidelines and and they use that as a starting point. And, and it's because we as an industry, university level upwards, don't get taught to actually uh, calculate what a job's going to cost you. So if you go to a lawyer, you'll find out pretty quickly how much um, that's going to cost you or they just charge you per hour uh, of what they're doing and they, they, they don't take no for an answer. Whereas as a profession, we tend to kind of work with these rules of thumb to say a job of costing X is going to, your fee should be Y or whatever that is. And that's to the detriment of our industry. And that's kind yeah. of why, why we are where we are is because people don't put, even if, like I say, it's 30 seconds worth of effort into just working out what is a job going to cost me. Um, and then you can make sure that at, le at the very least you're covering that cost. So a lot of architects don't actually cover that cost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that's, it, that's it, critical. And it's also when you've got these kind of standard rules of thumb from a client perspective, or like, you know, the Reba, Reba Plan of Work, for example, is a sort of standardized format of here's what architects do. Yeah. And then if you're accompanying that with a, a standardized set of here's how much it should cost, then a client kind of can come to you and say, well, you should be charging this, which again, doesn't help the architects because there's a huge amount of variation in the service that's going to be provided. Yeah. So I think, I mean, exactly right. And, and the other thing that architects don't do well is, under, is spelling out at the start what they are doing. Uh, so we, we tend to have a standard schedule of services, but almost as important is to, to uh, list the things that you're not doing as part of that service and itemizing them and saying, look, in this fee, we're not going to be doing that. And then later on, when it comes to that discussion with the client, you can refer back to the original fee proposal and say, actually, we, we're never going to do that. It was not included in the fee and then negotiate an additional fee. And the other key thing which a system like Fresh Projects does allow you to do is to be able to track the amount of effort you spend on uh, changes and variations. Right. So that's often where we end up losing all the money. So you, in your mind's eye, when you set off on this project, you're going to do one variation of, of or one uh, you're going to go through that once. Yeah, you have two, and, rounds, of, two rounds of variations yeah. and then ultimately it kind of... In the real world, that's three, four, five, six, however many different times. Um, and again, as a profession, as a personality type, we tend to just take the punches on that and we'll, we, we'll do it and we'll work extra hours and we'll work through the night to do it. Um, whereas if you actually are tracking just or itemizing separately and then tracking how much time and how much cost you've spent on all these variations, you may not get those fees back. It's always a difficult conversation with the client, but at least you've got some quantifiable data to... to go to the client and say, look, this is, we've spent this much money on all these variations mm. in, in, in delivering them. And that's a, that's a much better position to be in than just a gut feeling, which is what most of us have that, you know, we've done all this extra work, but you can't actually quantify it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of smirking in acknowledgement of <laughs> yeah. kind of using my intuition around yeah. uh, a project to try and feel it out and exactly. set your fees. And I think that, that as well like what would you say are the sort of the basic fundamentals of look when you are and 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 you know do your kind of analysis of a project um what are the major mistakes that architects or the things they actually miss out when 
working out their fees? Yeah, so I think, again, it goes back maybe to the history of how we've always calculated fees is that, and, and the way we teach each other in the industry and the way the industry works is we've kind of got these rules of thumbs or these uh, percentage of construction costs or whatever it might yeah. be. And that's the extent of which people work out the fee and it's, then it's just cross your fingers and hope it's yeah so it's we all like i mean when i've done that a lot and that's how i was trained as in part three is you know private residential projects it could be anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of the final construction cost of a project and at the outset of a project you know you're not always the the brief is yet to be defined so the budget is yet to be defined so it's the scope yeah yeah exactly so kind of there's so many unknowns already and we're starting to put proposals out with yeah and yeah so i think to answer the the previous question is understanding so not necessarily working from a point of just some sort of formula or rule of thumb um understanding and and you can build this up again through a system like fresh projects where you've got a history of you've done 10 side returns and you know actually when you look at the data you realize that in your mind's eye you think it'll take 100 hours worth of your time to do that but when you look back, you actually realize it takes 150 hours every time. Or be able to recognize patterns where you say, okay, if it is a heritage building or it is a certain type of project that adds X amount of effort into it. And if you've got that data to work with and it's easily accessible and it's not uh, one of those hectic spreadsheets that we hate looking at, it's at your fingertips, um, then you can learn from your mistakes and you can actually start applying that to the next job. And, and with authority, I think clients respond to if you're able to justify uh, what you're talking about and you can say, I know because I've done this so many times, it takes so long and mm. planning permission takes so much and all that sort of stuff. Um, then you're actually able to a, feel confident about when you're talking to your client, but also make sure that you're covering your costs. Yeah. Yeah. And also setting up, uh, you know, your profit margins and... Well, I mean, that's, that's an interesting debate in itself is that up until now we've talked about just covering your costs, which is the first step. But there is a, always this debate is architects are adding value to the clients. It's yeah. not just about paying your costs. And so there's an element of just above your costs is what degree of profit should the architects be making? You know, there's the whole talk of IP and all that sort of stuff. But that, that becomes a, a luxury you can think about as your business becomes more profitable. The first point, and a lot of architects struggle with this, is just making sure you are covering your costs as a starting point. Yeah, and it, and it's, it, it kind of uh, frightens me a little bit as well. I mean, I know, speaking to lots of architects, my own bad experience with, you know, kind of blindly uh, putting out proposals and... Uh, fees only to realize this is not going to cover my cost or not having an understanding of all of the expenses of running a practice as well as you know your, your printing costs your uh, travel costs and the, all the time that you end up spending you know licking stamps and yeah. dealing with the planning department all of that is kind of that can become unknowns as well um, so how do we how do we start to factor those into Projects. Yes. So, I mean, that's in itself is an amazing issue with the industry. So we do a bunch of talks. We go out and we do workshops with architects. And one of the exercises we do, and we're going to be doing this at the, the Business of Architecture event next month, is we ask the, the audience to tell us what does one hour of their time cost. And we, we give everyone the same data, so they're working from the same inputs. And it's... It's just mind-blowing, the, the, the range of answers we get for the same input data, the same financial data, how many different answers we get. And that just shows that architects don't know what they're doing when it comes to this. So yeah. you have to take into account uh, utilization of um, the different people in your business. So the amount of time they spend on projects versus non-project time. And you have to take into account your company overheads, your printing, your rent, your software licenses, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I don't think as an industry, as a profession, we're empowered to, to do those calculations and, and have a, f- a fundamental gut feeling of what uh, things cost. And we tend to end up guessing and then we, we get it wrong and yeah, the rest is history. And does, so does Fresh Projects then, does it mean, requ- does it require a lot of data capturing then, like lots of timesheets and 
how how does that data get captured? How so, do you bring that kind of awareness to all these systems in a business? So yes and no. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. So yeah. I, I can't sit here and say that there will be a system magically out there that'll do that all for you and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but we do try and minimize the extent to which it becomes a burden. Um, so yes, if you want to track how much jobs cost you, you're going to have to do timesheets. Um, and that's, yeah, not a lot of people enjoy doing timesheets. I hate doing timesheets myself. But unfortunately, if you want to know how much a job costs, you yeah. have to do it. Um, so the, the starting point is just to get your head around that and embrace it rather than fight it. Well, even that in itself can be an eye-opening experience when you're actually honest with yourself about here's how much time I'm spending on this Absolutely. versus how much time I'm spending on that. And it can be, when well, I've done that exercise before, it can be quite shocking. And I think the other thing that it opens your eyes to is when you look at it and timesheet data, and we've got nearly 18,000 projects in our database now, and we can analyze it across all these hundreds of practices. And you look at where the, the principals or the partners or the owners of a practice, and if it's a small practice, it might be the sole practitioner, mm. they spend... Uh, at least 50% of their time on non-project work. So it's running your business, it's going on holiday, it's uh, HR issues, it's looking after other people, all those things which actually don't bring in any money to your business. Um, and that's the scary bit because you actually, that cost has to be borne by your projects. So you, yeah. you have to uh, be aware of what that's costing you and, and just how much it's costing you. Um, and sometimes it's it's quite an eye opener to look at that and say, actually, rather than spending ten hours a week on doing my bookkeeping, I should get a bookkeeper in who I can pay for half the price, and you get to uh, leverage up your fee earning potential through mm. focusing on the right areas in your business. So it, I can see how that can kind of accompany a mindset shift as well, because you know a lot of architects will without doing the analytics, without actually doing the timesheets and measuring where time is being spent, there's the kind of reaction that I've, you know, I've got to do the admin because it's going to save me some money or yeah. it keeps cost down. And actually, then the bigger picture of things, it's like it's a money block, exactly. essentially. Yeah, and I think uh, having that visibility into your business, into your practice, where if, even if you're a one-man band, understanding how you're spending your time but in particular as you start to grow it becomes more and more difficult you're hiring in more people and we see we see because we've got a range of different practices uh, sizes using the system and it's really when you get to about five people in a practice where you kind of just up until that point you've kind of got a good co uh, control over who's doing what when and, and you, you know what's happening um, but as you get to that sort of point of five people it becomes very difficult to start understanding where everyone's spending their time and are they doing it effectively and that's where systems can start to help systems and processes can start to help you mm. continue to grow and make sure you're doing that as efficiently as you can and how does this sort of link into the kind of so we've discussed a lot about the operational costs of delivering a project what about the costs that are used for acquiring new clients yeah, so that's, that in itself is, is a very interesting to track. So uh, within the system, we make sure that on any given project, so even when it's at bid stage or tender stage, that you track your time against that job because a lot of people might write that off and say that's a cost of sales type um, mm. uh, cost. But in the construction industry, projects last a long time and you can sp easily spend uh, three months, sometimes six months, even I've heard, I mean, we've met some clients who've spent five years on a project before they earn the first uh, amount of money fee income on that job. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, so you've got to make sure that cost gets, when you look at the overall picture of, of the job and what it costs you, uh, that upfront cost of winning the job is a true cost on the job. Yeah. Uh, and that needs to be pictured into the whole picture, into the clients as well. Um, interesting thing about looking at clients is, um, particularly if you're a, a slightly bigger practice where you, you might be doing repeat work for a commercial type client, a developer of some sort, is actually uh, aggregating the data across multiple projects. You, you might have a client that you think is, is a great client, they give you a lot of work, 
but they're always dangling that carrot in front of you, saying the next job that comes along is going to be the big one. But we've just got this little job now that we just need you to, you know, cut your fees on. It's tight. You know, we'll, the next one's going to be big, and a lot of uh, architects fall into that trap. And then when you look across the data across three or four or five projects with that client, you realise that you've actually funded that client to the tune of, you know, hundred thousand pounds or two hundred thousand pounds. Um, and if you just stop working for that client, you can become more profitable overnight. Mm. And yeah, so wow. Yeah. So, so d is there an element of you, do you need to help uh, interpret some of the findings from the software to help architects kind of um, implement the changes into their businesses, or is it something they can just they can just do or? Yeah, so the, I mean, with anything, there's there's two elements to this. There's a system, which is our system, Fresh Projects, but there's there's a process and there's a culture. Um, and if you're going to implement this change in your practice, regardless of the system, the first step is making sure that as a as a process change and a cultural change, uh, you embrace it. You're not trying to fight it. Uh, you you're taking on board if you haven't done timesheets before, for example. We're going to start doing timesheets, and it's about explaining to everyone why you're doing this. You're not doing this because you're trying to make sure they're doing their work every day, and you you you're watching them like Big Brother. Yeah, we're doing this because we actually we want to be more profitable, and if we're more profitable, it means I can pay you more, and if I can pay, and you're going to get a bigger bonus, and everyone's going I mean, to be happier. In that little bit there, that's that's a loaded thing because I know you know. Uh, when you're implementing things like timesheets or when I've worked in practices before from the staff, if you don't know or have a, a broader picture, you just feel like it's, oh, we're being looked yeah. at. But actually, there's a bit of, like you say, developing a culture and having everybody involved with the profitability of a company. Yeah. And this is why we're implementing systems that changes the mindset totally. Yeah, and I mean, what we try and do, and it, it varies in different degrees, but with Fresh Projects is, is to... There's there's a concept and there's a sort of the older way of management which was keep them in the dark and feed them, um, but I think transparency, particularly in this day and age, with making everyone aware of what we're doing as a practice, which jobs we're winning, what the fee is, what our budget is, mm. and how you've been spending your time. So in the system, we try and bring that up, even if you're just a lowly uh, first year architect or a CAD operator, whatever it is, we try and give you some data back in the system to show you uh, how you've been spending your time, uh, what your utilization is, if, if you've got the right permissions to see the project, profitability, etc. Um, and I think people respond well to that. So if they feel part of the team that we're in this together, um, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, mm. they feel empowered and then you, your culture shift in the company changes as opposed to everyone just gets put in a corner and told what to do just told what to do and, and they don't understand the bigger picture so um, there, there certainly is a, a cultural shift uh, and and awareness that you need to implement um, but in terms of the systems itself again the focus in specifically fresh projects is to keep it simple so actually getting the system up and running is pretty straightforward it's about loading your projects loading your people and off you go and it's it's deliberately not complex, so we we don't want to try and make it a thing. You don't. It shouldn't be a, a burden. It shouldn't mm. be a, a monster that you have to feed. It should be something that kind of runs itself in the background. And is this something? I mean, you, you mentioned before that it, it, it this can help everybody from a sole practitioner to larger practices. Um, for from the perspective of smaller practices, how or why might there be some resistance there, do you think? Or So I think the very small practices, managing your practice is actually quite straightforward. You've got a number in your head and you've got to invoice that every month. Yeah. So actually, there's, apart from maybe the, the ability to make sure that you're getting your fee right from the outset, um, there maybe isn't as much value in, in implementing a system like this and there are other systems out there. Um, but certainly, as you get to sort of two, three, like I said, five people, um, there's definitely more value in, in being able to understand the various aspects of your business and the financial, uh, you know, the different areas of financial management. And what have been some of your favorite success stories that you've had with clients? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, um, 
the biggest kick we get is when people look, they've been using the system for six months or so, because uh, that's really when you start to get value out of it. So like I said earlier, understanding what previous jobs cost you and, and that sort of thing. And when they, they, they use the system and then suddenly realize, actually, this client who I thought was my best client is actually my worst client, mm. and I'm not going to work for them and suddenly become more profitable. And, and generally, we see um, that the people who are using the system are growing nicely. Um, so the practices just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I think everyone so far has joined. We have a very few people who've, who've left, left us. So Again, that's a kind of validation for us to say that it's working for them. So, and how does it operate? Is it a sub subscription, or is it a piece of software that you buy once? Or yeah, so we work on a subscription model. So we try and make the barriers to entry. So the sort of backstory to where Fresh Projects came from is I was working at a consulting engineering company, a big one, and we had a, a, a massively complex and expensive ERP system. Mm. We had sort of twenty people trying to keep this thing running every month. And we couldn't answer the three simple questions, which were what are projects are making money, which clients should I work for, and which staff are the most effective, despite spending millions on the system. Um, and that's <laughs> kind of where, where Fresh Projects was born. Um, and so we've, we've, we've specifically targeting in Fresh Projects the sort of bottom of the pyramid in the sense that um, not the multinational engineering or architectural practices, but we're looking for the, the small and medium practices. Um, and as a result, we, we make the, the sort of uh, the cost to get going is zero. It's just an ongoing subscription license. Um, and again, we don't try and force people into contracts or anything mm. like that. We say if you want to use it for one month, you can stop paying next month. And uh, yeah, you can, if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. But we found it, it generally does work. So. Um, yeah, so it's an ongoing monthly cost. It's not very much. It starts at five pounds a month per person. Um, and as you grow, you pay for more people. As you shrink, you'll pay for less. And we try and make it affordable for those SME practices, which is the bulk of the market. Right. Brilliant. And so what's next for Fresh Projects? So I think um, there's a lot more we can do. I think what to me is the most exciting bit is that as we grow and grow, we get more and more data about the industry and that we can use, obviously, with everyone's opt-in to actually empower the industry as a whole. So we can look at things like salary surveys, like how much are we paying people, what, sh what should we be paying people. We can start to look at uh, fees across industries and sectors and saying, okay, what are uh, the appropriate fees? And, and there's all sorts of analytics in that data, mm. which I think will empower the industry as a whole. And we can all learn and get better at out of that. So. Has there been a lot of uh, industry interest, say from the ROBA or from other professional institutions, about some of the data that you're you're capturing? Because that's a really interesting uh, set of statistics that you're yeah, being so able to being able to present. There is. I mean, there's obviously a lot of, and we we got to be careful about the sensitivity around this information. Right. Um, and who owns it? And at the moment, in all our agreements, the, the customer owns that. So, data. so okay. Yeah. So we don't we don't have any right to that data. We obviously store it on your behalf, but we don't sell it or analyze it or anything like that. Um, but yes, yeah, so th certainly where we've talked to the RIB and we're also operating in South Africa, the South African Institute of Architects. Um, there's there's incredible interest in, in having such a wide range of data across many projects. And particularly, I think what tends to happen when they do do these surveys is you'd have the bigger practices have the resources to respond to the surveys and the smaller practices just don't have the time to respond yeah. to it. So the data that they get from surveys is very one-sided. And to be able to have this data without anyone having to do anything, access to that data is, is very interesting. Amazing. Thank you very much, Simon. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at our event next month. It's going to be fun, yeah. And working through the cash flow exercise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Cheers. So that is a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. And don't forget to go and book your tickets for the Business of Architecture UK live event happening on the 11th of October 2018 at you and I offices. Tickets now on sale. All the information is in the link below. Look forward to seeing you there. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you 
be unstoppable.